Good morning, my name is Tim McConnell. This morning we're going to look at the topic of succession planning. Here's what we're going to cover. We're going to define our terms. We always like to define our terms so we're using the same language. So what is succession planning? We're going to look at the reasons why you might want to, in fact why you should have a succession plan. We're going to look at the benefits of a succession plan, some of the challenges, the real life challenges and pitfalls of, of that we've run into with clients and the client organizations run into with respect to, to succession planning. We're going to look at the difference between replacement planning and succession planning. They are two different things. And lastly, we'll look at the process. What is involved in succession planning? How do, we, how do I do it? So that's our agenda. So, what is succession planning? At one level, it's filling someone else's shoes. So we have the little kid here in the, in the big shoes. Um, to some extent, that's what it's all about. It's about growing that, that little kid so that he fills those shoes and that he walks in them as well as the, the previous owner of the shoes did. So it's a systematic process. So key two words here, it's a process and it needs to be followed in a systematic, logical, ordered manner. So it's a process for defining and filling future management needs. Another key word here is, is uh, actually the word's not even there, but it's, it's planning. Uh, it's up there, succession planning. Planning is all about thinking ahead and anticipating a future, creating a willed future, and making it happen. So it's a process of developing talent to meet the needs of the organization now and in the future. So another key phrase here, developing talent usually for the most part internal talent so we're growing our talent so we're not simply uh, when a senior position becomes vacant running out and, and trying to find a replacement in a hurry so it's flexible it's long-term as a long-term perspective and it's very developmental focused on future management staffing <coughs> question for you what do the following people share in common So look at the titles of their jobs, they're all presidents. President, president, chairman, chief executive officer, president, president. What do they all have in common? <clears throat> they're all dead. Uh, and more importantly, they all died in the same place at the same time, in one of President Clinton's uh, trade missions to Bosnia in the 1980s. So the question is, were these organizations, and look at all the big company names here, prepared for the sudden loss of their chief executive officer. It'd be interesting to go back and, and look at the, the financial performance of these companies <coughs> uh, a month later, a year later, and say, okay, which one of these companies had a succession plan in place? And, and, and when this disaster happened and all of a sudden they're, uh, the, um, the chief executive officer is no longer there, uh, were they able to sort of, you know, take the person they had identified in the succession plan and, and have that person fill in right away? Or were they running around in a mad panic? It would be interesting to look at that. But you never know what's going to happen. So that's one reason for a succession plan. Other reasons are business continuity planning, organizations, uh, responsible organizations. Think ahead. Plan for the worst, hope for the best, and, and know that uh, things may happen, things may go wrong, etc. So let's prepare for it. So that's business continuity planning. Business continuity planning, BCP, is normally financially oriented. It's, it's looking at, okay, who's going to sign the certain documents? Where, where is our, uh, our data stored? Uh, is it in a safe place? this kind of thing. but So we're extending that, that business concept to human resources management and saying think about business continuity planning for your executives and people in other key positions. <clears throat> other reasons for a succession plan, we want to identify high talent individuals in the organization, grow them, promote them, develop them. We want to promote employee development, the whole sense of the fact that, that I'm coming to work here and it's not just about the job today that I'm, that I'm doing sitting at this desk or, or the deadline next week. It's about, it's not static, it's dynamic in the sense that it's about developing people over time, growing them over time. It's a refinement to your corporate planning exercise and its goal is to establish a talent pool for your business. So what are some of the challenges organizations face when they're doing succession planning? 
There's lots of, this is not an easy thing. Lack of management support is, is the main one. Senior management needs to be totally on board with this. Um, in fact, it's, they're participating in it. They're, uh, a lot of the jobs that we're talking about in the succession plan are applying to them. Uh, obviously, they have to be on board. It has to be something that you've, you've given a fair bit of thought to and you're committed to. It's not something that, that we just stop and say, hey, let's do this and then, and then forget it. Or someone says, uh, Tim, I need you. we should do succession planning. And, and the organization says, hey, yeah, we did that a couple of years ago. Check that box. It's done. We're finished. We're happy. Uh, no. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. The plan needs to be updated regularly, semi-annually and annually. So it's not an HR problem. This is another thing we see with clients. Oh, this is one of those warm and fuzzy HR things that you people want to do. Uh, no, it's business continuity planning. It's, uh, it's not an HR problem. It's not an HR task or responsibility. It's something that's shared by the board, by your senior leadership team, by managers at all levels of the organization, and your staff. Other things we see, insufficient preparation. You need to do this properly. There is a process to follow, which we're going to address. Uh, you can't just wing it. Lack of understanding of what the program is, what it requires, understaffing the effort. Uh, it is a, not a significant effort, but there's a certain amount of effort involved in, in getting this done. Establishing confused or overly ambitious goals. So you need to be clear, precise, and realistic about what you're trying to accomplish and how. And failing to hold people accountable. There are challenges to be faced. There are things that have to be done by certain dates. These need to be checked up on, evaluated after the fact to make sure that, that yes, that, that action item happened by that person on that date. Otherwise, the thing will just wither on the vine. <clears throat> so now that you've done that, what about the benefits? Some of the benefits of the succession plan are there's less time and expense required to fill vacancies because the talent has already been identified and prepared. So people leave jobs. Sometimes people give you lots of notice. The person who's retiring may say, hey, I'm giving you two years notice. I'm 63 years old. Then I'm going to be out of here when I'm 65. Well, that's, that's good to know. Other times, it's, it's extremely sudden. It could be the, the decapitation, if you will, of, of your executive team in, in a plane crash. <clears throat> It could be uh, a senior manager or a key person coming along and said, hey, I just won the lottery. I'm moving to Hawaii tomorrow. Or, uh, or the company down the road made me a better offer, a way better offer, and, and I'm leaving. Here's my two weeks notice. Thank you very much. So you're the director of HR. You're, you're a senior line vice president. This happens to you. A key position is, is suddenly going to be vacant. What do you do? Are you ready for this? If you're not ready, then you're scrambling around trying to find a replacement internally. You're scrambling around trying to, to post an ad and, and, and get a replacement and go through the entire recruiting process. That takes a long time. If you've got a succession plan in place where you've identified your key positions, you've identified the competencies for those key positions, and you've identified your, your potential replacements for every key position, and you know who's ready today, who may be ready in a year, then it's simply a matter of going to that list and saying, okay, oh, Susan here is ready today because Tim just left this, this job in this organization. We're going to tell Susan, okay, step in, and, and then go from there. So it saves you a lot of time and money. Uh, you can align your, uh, we're very big fans of the word alignment, uh, aligning people development efforts and HR management with strategic objectives. So you always have, this is one of our favorite sayings, the, the right people available at the right times and the right places to meet the right objectives. And you want to be prepared, as I said, for any sudden losses. So what is replacement planning and how is it different from succession planning? Uh, so there is a difference. Uh, don't confuse the two. Replacement planning is, is short term. It's all about finding backups to fill vacancies on the organization chart. It concentrates on immediate needs. So I've got a vacant position. I need a body to come and fill that job right now. That's replacement planning. It's a snapshot assessment of the availability of qualified applicants for key vacancies. 
If you think about it, when you, when you go in to buy a house, you're, you're you're ready to buy a house, and 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 maybe you, you've already sold your old house, and you're looking at all the houses, and and you're shopping around. But what are you actually looking at? You're only looking at the houses that are available on the market for sale at that exact time when you're ready to buy, which may be two percent of the entire neighborhood. <coughs> and the house that you'd really like over there is not for sale. Unless you're a millionaire, you can make the guy an offer he can't refuse. But uh, replacement planning is, is like that. We have a, a vacant position comes along, and, and we need to fill it very suddenly. And I can only look at the candidates that are available and ready today uh, because I've not established a, a broader pool of talent that I can draw on. Which, so it's obviously a better business practice and a better management practice. So su su succession planning is about grooming the talent needed for the future. It's looking more at uh, longer term needs. It's looking more at cultivation. Uh, I like that word, growing uh, people over time. It involves much more intensive management review, succession planning does, uh, looking at job requirements, the requirements and needs of the organization, assessing candidates, and, uh, and looking at specific developmental interests and choices of the candidates. So there's choice involved on their part. So if we compare the two, we compare replacement planning with succession planning, as this slide does. We can see what are some of the differences here. Replacement planning is reactive, the job becomes vacant, and, and I'm reacting to that, that problem. That, that's all of a sudden been put in front of me. Succession planning is proactive and saying, okay, we know that job's going to become vacant at some point in time. In fact, that's a truism in all of this, is that unless you're immortal, um, some of us are going to, at some point in time, uh, we're not going to be around anymore. So irrespective of whether we resign early or, or stay to, to, to 105 years old, at some point in time, every single job is going to become vacant. So let's recognize that reality and plan for it. So it is a form of risk management. We're planning and creating a, a willed future for future development. We're not just substituting person A for person B, we're renewing the organization, we're renewing the, the talent that, that is in that job. So it's not a narrow approach, it's, it's aligned and organized and planned, and it's extremely flexible. So there's lots of great reasons why we want to do succession planning. Other differences are time frames, so let's come back to this. Replacement planning is, uh, is short term, uh, succession planning is longer term. Resources, as I mentioned, we can only look at the, the best candidate available at the time, not the best in, in a broader talent pool. The level of planning is different in terms of how, how we go through the selection and placement process. Our, our selection focus uh, in, in replacement planning, we're looking at a vertical line of succession. So if there's a director, we're probably saying, okay, can that manager step in and fill that job? So it's, it's a vertical talent ladder, career ladder. Whereas in succession planning, we can develop a much broader general talent pool over time because we have the luxury of time here. It, we can move people around. We can take the finance person and, and teach them HR. We can take the HR person and give them experience in finance. So you've got, at the end of the day, the organization has seasoned, ex seasoned executives that know what it's like to work in other departments. Our people, executives can come from corporate head office and go and work in a plant environment for a while to get that, that feel. What we see with family owned businesses where there's, there's a son or a daughter, a second generation that's coming up, we know they're going to be president someday. Do they just step into the job when they're 21 years old as a, as a new president? No, the, the, the families that plan that properly Take that person, educate them, and say, okay, you're going to go work for a year in, 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 on the processing line, and you're going to go within work for a year in procurement, and you're going to then go for a third year and work at estimating, and they work their way around the organization. Ten years later, you have a new executive who's, who's experienced personally every aspect of their business. So decision making is different. Uh, we tend to have a broader pool of people involved in decision making for succession planning. And we're, the candidate evaluation process is different. We're not just looking on our assessment of, of the replacement candidate's performance. 
We're looking at, uh, at not just past performance uh, and current competencies, we're looking at a much broader assessment of that person over time and we've been able to test them in a variety of uh, different job assignments. So there's a process involved here. We have steps, we're very, big in pro we're very big on processes. This is what consultants do. It's a way to make things happen. Anything, including succession planning, can look very complicated from the outside. So we take it and we say, okay, what are we trying to accomplish at the very end? Where are we gonna start? What's the first thing we should do? So it's baby steps. And then after we've done that, what's the second thing we should do? And, 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 and let's plan it out and, and write it down so that we've got all our steps and we know how to do this so we can do it again. So step one, identify key positions or key groups. We're, we're gonna come back to that. Identify the competencies for your, your key positions or groups. Identify candidates and assess them. Plan your learning and development for people that aren't necessarily ready to, to move into that job that we've identified them for. What, what, what's that gap between where that person is today where, what the competencies are that they're going to need tomorrow, and how do we train for that? Do we give them developmental assignments? Do we send them back to school? Do we teach them new skills? How do we bridge that gap? So that's what we're talking about here, number four. And then we implement the strategy. We put in place the plan, and we evaluate its effectiveness. So as I said, we don't just say, yeah, we've done that, check off that box, and, and let's forget about it, and we'll dust it off in five years and see what's going on. Uh, it needs to be evaluated and updated regularly. We have several clients that we know that the senior leadership team with the board of directors sits down and reviews the, the succession plan every six months, because it changes. So let's look at that in more detail. Step one, identify key positions or key groups. It's not just about senior management. It's identifying other people in the organization. So we're using the concept of, of mission critical positions, mission critical jobs. So these are our criteria, these are some of the things to consider. Is the position a key contributor to the organizational mission, the, the job, the position, not, not the current incumbent? Is it involved in strategic decisions? Is it a leadership role? Is it a critical function? There may be jobs in your business that are absolutely crucial to the running of your business that aren't necessarily senior management. So does the job perform tasks that are critical to vital functions? Would leaving it vacant hinder or prevent the success of a project? In fact, we can summarize this entire page to say, if that job suddenly became vacant, would it be a problem for your business? <coughs> if it is, then we need to plan for it. Is, is this a job where the incumbent is the only person in the company who holds important corporate knowledge and information? And if they leave, all the information is in their head, they're walking out the door with that information. Is there a high level of involvement in core business processes that if you took the person out of that job, your core business processes wouldn't necessarily work as, as well? Again, that's a problem. Is it essential in nature? Would, would the company, uh, like ABC or whatever we call it, suffer if the position was not filled? Would there be a rapid breakdown in operations if there's a sudden absence of an incumbent? Is, is the job specialized? You may have jobs that where the person, aside from the corporate knowledge, is the only person in the company with that skill set. And again, what do you do? How do you replace them if they, if they leave suddenly? which is why, frankly, you should be cross-training your people and, and always have backups. Uh, the, a lot of these comments are internal. Let's now look at external in terms of staffing. So the job becomes vacant, we have to replace them. Ideally, we've got this internal talent pool that we can draw on that we've prepared in our succession plan. <coughs> but how vulnerable are we here if, if we don't have a succession plan? So it's a job in a class or occupational group where there's high turnover because there's high demand in the market. So we know that that um, that so and so we use the term flight risk that that a so and so in a person may have to if they leave suddenly it's because they're they're being recruited away. So we use the term flight risk to say there's a higher than usual danger of that person leaving an organization. And are we ready for that? And then how difficult is it to fill? If your accounts payable clerk 
quits tomorrow, you can call up an agency, you can post an ad in the paper, you can you know make a few calls, post a job on, on Workopolis or a bulletin board, and you'll have 25 applicants for your accounts payable clerk by 5 o'clock this evening. So it's not a hard job to fill. It's very common, and there's lots of people with those skills. But what if it's not? What if, if there's a very major shortage in supply of people with those skills in that job. What are you going to do? You can't just say, assume that, hey, we're going to post a job and, and they will all come and apply. I mean, that's very nice. It works for the accounts payable clerk, but it doesn't work for highly specialized skills or especially skills that are in high demand. So don't assume that you can immediately replace from outside. So if you can't immediately replace from outside, and imagine being the director of HR and going to the to a director of operations and saying, I know, you know, that job is left and it's crucial in your core business processes and, and you need those skills and it's affecting the operation and it's affecting the profitability of our company, but I'm very sorry, but I can't find anyone to fill that job. How does that make HR look? Uh, it makes you look very bad, frankly, because you haven't done your job in anticipating and planning in advance for that problem. So that's step one. Step two, identifying competencies. Competencies are the, the skills, both the, the hard skills and the soft skills, the attributes, the attitudes, the aptitudes uh, that are required in, in a given position. We can identify them and, and we can measure them. We can measure the level of competency that's required in a given position. And we can measure, identify and measure the competency that an individual person has and then see what the gap is. So that's essentially what we're doing here. For each role, for each position that we've identified uh, in step one as being a, a crucial position, uh, i.e. one to be included in our succession plan, we would, uh, so we've identified that position, we need to look at the job description, so yes, you should have job descriptions. You do not have to be bureaucratic about it and, and have 25 page job descriptions, which we've seen. Uh, a few pages is fine as long as it covers all of the required information. So review it, is it accurate and up to date? Uh, talk to current and former job incumbents to identify the competencies that, that were and are required for that position. You can uh, identify interview other people, supervisors, clients, and say, okay, what skills does that, that job need? Uh, and, and get that view of it. So you're not, you're asking real people real questions. You're not simply making it up or, or assuming something. So at the end of the day, we've got a list of competencies for the key positions in our succession plan, and we're writing them all down. So it says here, president and CEO. Um, <coughs> Presumably and obviously, they need strong leadership and management skills. They need to be a relationship and consensus builder. They need to have sound judgment, excellent communication skills, all these kinds of things. So you probably know that, but write it down. Spell it out. So that's step two, identifying and assessing potential candidates. Sorry, step three is identifying and assessing potential candidates. So here we're, we've... We're now looking at the supply side. So in step one and step two, we looked at, at the position. Is it a crucial position? What are the competencies required to fill it? Now we're going to look at the people that potentially could fill that position. So how do we identify them? How do we know who they are? And how do we assess them? So in step three, we're, we're going through a, per, a process of identifying and assessing potential candidates against their job competencies uh, and identifying, if any, uh, required learning and development that would prepare them for the role. So we call them successors, and the identification of them should be objective and, and free of personal bias. It should be free, frankly, of, of any bias. Uh, it should be very much merit-based, so focused on performance. It should be communicated to and understood by the employees. If you are identifying and assessing potential candidates for a role in your succession plan, you need to be talking to them. We've seen organizations where they do have a succession plan. They do have identified candidates for jobs, and they've never told the people. So imagine that surprise. Hey, Tim, son, the job just became vacant. We're promoting you. Well, thank you very much, but maybe I'm not skilled or qualified, and, and maybe I don't want that job. So the, the individual has to be obviously part of the process. So you need to be transparent at all stages. 
So we can have a tool here, an assessment framework that says, okay, here's a candidate for my for the vice president's job replacement over time. Who are they? How old are they? Age internally is a factor. Uh, how long have they been with the organization? How long have they been in their current job? What's their salary? What is their performance rating? We need to know all this as part of the assessment. What is their potential? Um, is it someone that's new in the job and, and it's going to take them several years, so uh, their potential is there, but it's longer term? Is it, is it outstanding in terms of that person's potential to rise up through the organization to a higher level position? And are they ready? Again, if, if they're new, then they're not ready. If they've only been in their current job a year or two, they may not necessarily be ready. Depends on the skill set. Uh, or are they ready now? So if you can identify that, that stage of readiness, then when the time comes to, to implement that succession plan, especially if the job becomes vacant suddenly, then, then we can go and say, okay, who have we identified? And, um, and yes, okay, two to four years is, is someone's ready tomorrow. Uh, sorry, not tomorrow, but in two to four years, well, that's not going to help us today. Then who's ready now? In fact, you should always hopefully have your ready nows in place. Obviously, it depends on the size of your organization. But that would be the ideal. Continuing with our step three, we can have a model that looks like this. We've identified the successors by levels. We have a diagram. And as I said, we've identified uh, level one ready now, level two ready in 12 months. So that is there. So we know that the replacement potential future replacement for the president and CEO, assuming that we, we don't want to necessarily hire from within, for that position, some organizations find uh, there's benefits in going externally, but not necessarily for other internal positions. So for these jobs, who's, who are the potential candidates and what is their, their level of readiness? For those that are not ready, and, and frankly, most people will not be ready immediately for the next job uh, uh, that they've been identified for as a successor, we need then to get into learning and development. What are we trying to do here? We're trying to move that person, bridge that gap from, from where their skill set is today and what the job is requiring tomorrow and, and bridging that gap and saying, getting, saying how are they going to acquire that experience and that knowledge and those skills. Key points to consider in designing a learning and development plan. So this is part of a broader human resources strategy, so it assumes that you have a, a training and development strategy and plan in place and, and someone to look after it. We want to focus on decreasing and removing the gap between the expected competencies that, that we know are there and the current knowledge of the successor. So it's all about removing that gap. We want to design a plan that maximizes the successor's potential. So we're invested in that person's success and in the success of this plan. Uh, what can we do? We can do a variety of different things. It includes job assignments or projects. So ideally you have an organization where you can take that, that rising star, that high potential candidate who's part of your succession plan and say, okay, how are we going to get you new experience? Well, let's take you out of your department where you already know everything uh, to, to manage that department. Let's put you in a new ground, a new area, have you learn that. Or if even within a department, you can identify assignments, projects, extra things for that person to do, and, and then measure their performance against that. So we want to make sure that we're at the same time going the other way, if you will, coming from top to down, that we want to transfer corporate knowledge to the successors. So it's more than just having them develop uh, from the ground up, if you will. It's, it's making sure that they're nurtured uh, and mentored and, and coached from the top. So you can identify mentors for that person. Most good succession plans have a mentoring plan in place so that that person can sit down and with a, a casual advisor who's not their direct superior, who's not doing their performance appraisal, to talk about uh, their performance, their development, and, and how they should, uh, in any given situation, respond to a, a crisis or, or a problem. So that person, the mentor, is their advisor. Uh, coaching is, uh, is different than mentoring, but uh, equally as relevant. Job shadowing, uh, if you want to know what a job looks like, follow the person around, literally, for, for a while. Documenting critical knowledge. If people are leaving, exit interviews are a good practice.
step five, so we have the succession, a succession plan in place. We need to implement it uh, and then monitor and evaluate it over time. So when a vacancy occurs for a job that's in the succession plan, we, we pull it out, literally. We review the succession plan, uh, determine, you should already know, frankly, but confirm, identify, remind yourself who the, the successor is, uh, their level of readiness, uh, where there is a successor, the successor, transfer them into the new planned role. The third aspect of our uh, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation process, after we've reviewed the file, identified the successor, is, uh, is recognizing the reality of what happens if we don't have a successor for that job right now at, uh, in order to fill it. So what are some of the options? Uh, we use the term uh, build and buy in an organization. So what, we, what this whole succession plan is about is, is, is building your own resources, building your own bench, bench strength and, uh, and skills within the organization. If you can't build them over time or the time that you need to fill that vacancy right now, then, then you, what are your choices? Well, then you can buy. So buy in, in HR world is, is hiring a contact person or a contingent employee. You can fill a job from outside, obviously, but that takes a fairly long time. So on a short-term basis, you can bring in a contractor, a contingency person. There are a lot of, of semi-retired senior executives out there that, that you may be able to bring in on a short-term contract immediately. In fact, a good HR person will have identified those people in, in your local labor market. You can borrow them, you can bring in a, a consultant. We've gone in, in, in our firm a number of times where there was an immediate vacancy in HR and, and, and ran the HR department for, for days, weeks, months until they were able to get back up the stream. So consultants are there. You can outsource that part of it. Again, all of these things should have been thought of in advance. Things to remember. In closing, there are several things that you need to remember as you're going ahead in the development of, of your succession plan. First of all, you need an organizational plan, an organizational strategic plan, a, a business plan in place. Uh, all of this is, is part of HR management. It's part of supporting the business goals of your organization. It's part of aligning the skills, the resources, the people we have in our business to those business priorities. So they obviously need to be identified. So you also then need an HR business plan that is fully integrated with your business plan. You need to prepare the succession plan following the steps that we've outlined in this seminar. You definitely need to involve your CEO and senior management team. They are vital to the process. Wherever possible through all of this and through all of HR management, you should be using HR metrics performance metrics to track the development of staff over time, to track how much money you're spending on training and development, to track training hours. There's a variety of, of metrics uh, we can use here and then reporting on those on a regular basis so we know how we're doing. It's very important to know how we're doing. You need to be using competencies if you're not familiar with them. There's lots of information out there about competencies, standard competencies for executive management positions. So you can look at those identify which ones are relevant to your business and to your positions uh, and then go from there. You need to identify key and target positions using that list that we had of, of, of key criteria for mission critical positions. You need to develop career maps. We're big fans of career maps. A career map is taking your organization chart, looking at, at the different occupational areas and saying okay how can somebody over time move up through the organization. So it could be a, a development and, and progression within a certain career path. So you, in your IT department, people, the career path a map would look starting as a programmer or a junior analyst, moving up to a programmer analyst, moving up to a systems analyst, moving into a supervisory position, then a management position, then, then a director position. There's a very clear career map in, in most larger IT departments. But do that for your other functions. It is a function of size as well. And then, and then stop and think, okay, let's not limit it to, uh, to one department. Let's do something where people can move around. So a typical career ladder today is not a ladder <coughs> that I used to get up on my roof. It's, it's more like a climbing wall. So yes, I can go vertically, but I can also go horizontally. So I can climb up here, but no, I'm blocked here. I can go over here, even take a step back, get, get experience in this area, and now I'm over here, and now I have a clear path to move up vertically. So it's literally a, a climbing wall.
What else do we have? Uh, so that was career maps. You need to have an effective performance management system in place. So why are you doing performance appraisals with staff? It, it starts with job descriptions. It, it links to, to training and development opportunities. But you need a process in place in your business to measure and assess accomplishments and performance and, and how people are moving forward to be able to react to that, to, to reward, so compensation is part of this as well, to reward good performance and to address performance that, that is less than good. So you need that, that policy in place and the processes and procedures. Your managers need to be trained on how to do performance appraisals, so it all has to work. So that's a key part of this as well. You need to go through the process, which was step one and step two of our succession planning processes, was to identify and develop high potential talent. And lastly, this is something that we see is interesting, treat your high potential talent as a shared resource. So sometimes we'll say to, uh, we're working with a director in a department and we're talking about a high potential employee and, and how we're going to develop them. And the development requires that this high potential person get, get an assignment for six months or a year in another department. Or that other department may be doing the same thing and so we're going to trade. So the director of that department says to me, Tim, let me get this right. I'm running this department, I have performance targets to meet, I've developed and trained my people, I have a well-oiled machine, I've got, I've got a team that's working, we're accomplishing our goals, everything's great. And you expect me to take a key person, have them leave my department, bring in some newbie that I have to train over and above my day job, and, uh, and how is this a good thing? Because my performance is, is, is going to drop a little bit, the, the performance of my department. And that person has a point. But if you look at it from the view of their department, yes, it's an issue. If you look at it from the broader view of the business and the organization over time, yes, there's some short-term turbulence when, when you take people out of a skilled area and move them into an area where they're less skilled. So we recognize that. However, over time, for the organization as a whole, at the end of the day, we now have people that are cross-trained. So if that position becomes vacant, that person that was over here on, on an assignment for a while can, can step into this job as a successor for that, that job. Or if this person uh, wants to go on a vacation for a month, then, then we've got someone that can step in. Or if there's extra work, uh, a big project comes along and, and we need all hands on deck, then we have people from other departments that we've trained in this department to, move, to come in and to help. So we can move them in to help out. So treat your employees as shared resources. Your managers do not own their own staff. The company, the broader organization, owns their own staff. So this is our view of succession planning. That's the end of our seminar. We hope you consider the, the benefits of a succession plan in your business because it will help your business and your performance. Thank you very much.